I'm here with Adam Goldsmith. It's not quite the same saying cheers with a cup of coffee, cheers. but Sorry. cheers, mate. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, a London-based session guitarist and um, all-around super nice guy. Um, yeah, so we're here going to talk about guitar. I've got a few questions from people um, and various different things. And uh, yeah, thanks, Adam. It's awesome. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, um, and we have a special guest. Can you see the dog? <laughs> I think so. I think that shot over there is great. Um, who's oh, <coughs> super cute. Um, so, you, you were born in London, is that right? Not born? far. Yeah, I was born, well, technically I was born in Oxford. Um, uh, I grew up uh, just outside of Reading, which is about 45 minutes away. Mm. Yeah. So, you, so you're, you're, you're an English guitar player. And I'm an English all, guitar player, yeah. You've, have you, right. have you, you've travelled a lot but, um, with, with music and stuff? Yeah, I suppose, well, not so much recently. I did, in my sort of, the, the, my 20s and 30s, I did quite a lot of travelling and touring. Uh, but I didn't, uh, not so much recently. I'm off to Italy in a couple of weeks. But, uh, yeah, I did. I mean, the last really extensive touring that I did was, there, was, there were, is an English opera singer called Catherine Jenkins. Uh, she's not English, she's Welsh, what am I saying? British. Mm. So, um, and she, we did a sort of, I guess it was almost a world tour. It was, we did Europe, America and Australia. We were supposed to go to New Zealand as well, but we didn't end up going, which was a shame. Uh, and that was maybe 11 years ago, 10, 10 years ago, something like that. Is that because you've got family now? It's it is, it, yeah, it is easier, but also sort of my career went in a different way. I ended up doing more studio work. So m most of my work is within sort of five miles. I live in North London. Mm. Dogs, dogs had enough. He's bored. <laughs> you guys are See you later. About yeah, sorry. About <laughs> um, uh, he's going to knock your camera over. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, so you make a living from doing sessions here? Or well, I mean, I, I th I'm not sure that anyone makes a living from just doing sessions anymore, to be honest. I think that you have to... Um, one of the big things I'd say is having not necessarily different income streams because that sounds a bit businessy, but uh, certainly you know different facets to your playing. Mm. So I, I'll do gigs, and uh, you know I've done a lot of TV over the years, um, West End shows as well, uh, all sorts, all sorts really, you know. But um, the studio stuff, studio and, and TV, sort of film and TV has been a big part of the last ten years or something. Mm. I'd say, yeah. And the scene seems quite healthy here in that respect. Yeah, I think it is pretty healthy. You do tend to see a lot of the same people. Yeah, of course. You know, in in studios and in, in that's suitable. Yeah, it is. It is. It's not huge, but it is healthy. Yeah, I'd say, mm. I'd say there's probably here. I imagine Los Angeles. I've only ever oh, played yeah. played there with English bands, so I've never played with American band in LA. If you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, but I think that the possibly if yeah if you want to make a living as a as a session player, whatever that means, um, you. It's probably here or Los Angeles, possibly New York. I don't think so much anymore. New York. Yeah, this um, is, from what I know, there's yeah, I think it's more of a jazz, there. jazz or Broadway kind of town, mm. you know. Which forget making a living out of jazz music. <laughs> forget that. <laughs> <my, yeah. laughs> Unless anyway, you can live on twenty quid a week. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, most of the guys I know that live in New York do that. They do um, theatre shows. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like yeah, easy money and it's yeah. Um, yeah. And you can and you can dip out fifty percent of the time. Yeah, it's absolutely. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of that. Over the years, yeah, yeah. So, um, did you study at music school? I think you did, didn't you? I did. Uh, actually, I did a classical degree. I went to Birmingham, mm. and yeah, I did a classical degree. I, to be honest, I, it sounds a bit posher than it is. I didn't really. I like the, the academic side of it was good. I like the history of, of music and everything. But my classical guitar lessons, um, I generally didn't. I generally sort of tried to get lessons with the jazz guys instead. Yeah, right. So, I, saying I've got a degree in classical music sounds like I'm actually better than I, <laughs> I am. You know, but, uh, is that where you learned to read music, or could you read? No, I could read music. Uh, my mum was a, a classical piano player, so okay. she taught me. I mean, I was five. I don't remember not being able to read music. So I was five or six. So it's like it's one of those things. You know, when you're that age, yeah, it just goes in. It goes in. You know, and then that sort of transferred over onto the guitar. Which I started when I was twelve, and uh, yes, yeah, so I did a classical degree, and then I did a jazz postgrad at the Royal Academy, which is here in London, mm -hmm. um, which was really hard, <laughs> mm. really hard. But actually, what was what was more use than than both of those? To be honest, but I was in the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, oh, right. which was where I met. That was like a train. It's been a, historically a training ground for professional musicians in London for forty years. 
30 or 40 years. And, and that's where you made all your contacts? And that's where I made a lot of them there in mm. college, yeah, a lot of them, yeah. yeah. And um, did, you, did you have anybody who kind of mentored you and got you kind of started in... Guitar players? In, or, or just musicians in general and getting you into this kind of scene and into this world? Um, Was there somebody kind of took you under their wing or did you just... No, not really. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> you did it the hard way, yeah. like me. Um, no. Not really. No, I wouldn't. I couldn't really pick one person. I mean, I had a when I was fourteen. I had a great guitar teacher called Hugh Turner, who was like the local guy in Reading. Um, but in terms of the music business, no, you just sort of end up doing it. Mm. You, you have to, you know, it's quite hard. I think it's a hard stage when you when you're starting out in your twenties. I think it's certainly a lot harder then than it is now. So if I go to a session now, there's a good chance that pe- I will be working with people that I've been working with for a long time. Mm. So you don't feel as much pressure. But when you're the new boy, when you're like. 21 or whatever that's pretty hard you know yeah. so I don't remember I mean I guess to an extent that when I when I first started doing that kind of you know commercial work there was your first sort of uh, rhythm section the really grown up rhythm section that I, that I worked with was Steve Pierce and Ralph Salmons who I um, mean you know they're both friends of mine now Steve lives around the corner he's a really good friend mm. um, and they sort of they were welcoming and they were very encouraging so uh, I guess if I had to find someone to say that about it would probably be them you know that's 20 years ago now so and they were they were really cool you know they were welcoming and they they um i got a lot of advice off those guys you know but not not there wasn't a guitar player really mm. that helped me out you know and who, who are the guitar players you look up to obviously you talked about we talked about robin ford and larry carlton and people like that but yeah i mean, would depend if, i mean there's hundreds of Mm. There's uh, all of them, all, all of them. You know, <laughs> there's not a day goes by when I don't see. I mean, yeah, like, I do a bit of teaching as well. I teach at the Guildhall, oh, nice. which is a music college here. Yeah. Um, can you hear the dog eating in the background? <laughs> yeah, that's right. We get an instant sound slurping in the background. <laughs> it's a dog. It's not anything weird. Yeah, Adam, Adam makes his living. Yeah. Like, Supports <laughs> that over there as well. Yeah. <laughs> um. So t- t- the other thing someone asked too was they, they wondered um, if you go out to a session, what gear you choose and why, because they said getting around London is so difficult, especially on the tube oh, yeah. and things like that. It's like, I couldn't even imagine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well... What do you drive, obviously? What do I drive? Ferrari, two do Ferraris. You, do you drive? Both at once do I drive? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I've got, I've got a smart car, so it can't fit any gear in that, obviously. But uh, mm. my, um, t- I tell you what I do, actually, to be honest, generally these days... I'd get Ubers, because and the reason why, <laughs> taxi advice. The reason why <laughs> um, is like if I'm going from here to say Angel or Abbey Road or one of those studios. I mean the three main commercial studios here really are Abbey Road, Angel, and Air mm-hmm. Lindhurst, which is in Hampstead, which is ten minutes away. What what informs those decisions? Do you, do you know in advance what gear you need? And a, a, a lot of the time you'll get an idea of what you need so usually fixers like say film fixers or something they'll give you uh they'll say acoustic and electric or something so there you've got to start and then I, I usually email them and just say you know is there any particular style or anything they want so if you if it's like a um i mean i did a while ago a film with a bunch of uh, elton john's music so i wanted to take stuff from the 60s and the 70s and, and you know yeah, so uh, yeah, so we did the film with a bunch of Elton John's music. The film was called Sherlock Gnomes. I think it's like a kids' oh, film right. or something. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's done okay. It's the second one, but anyways, it was had a lot of his music. So I wanted to take a lot of stuff from you know vintage gear, basically. So I had my little old Princeton and a um, couple of other things. I've got like a Dumble style amp, and I took my my sixties three three five. Uh, I've got a great seventies SG which I like, and I had at the time, which I don't have now. A fifty nine uh, Junior which is a nice. great, oh, it's a beautiful guitar. I wish I hadn't sold it. but uh, So you get you get an idea. Uh, but the, the thing is also, you know, it is difficult to get around, but budgets for stuff like that, you get a fee called Porterage, which I believe in America they're called Cartage. Cartage yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so you, I pay for somebody to move my gear. So they come here and pick it up. And they take it to the studio, and then they set it up for you, and so you just you can walk in. So yeah, usually for stuff like that, if it's a like a non porterage or non cartage session, then I will take what I can fit in my car or or in a taxi. You know, and that's right. it. But you just, yeah, I mean, I guess the trick is you just have to ask. You just mm. ask the person who's employing you, what's the style, and then you know if they say it's a country session, I take my Fender amp and I take a Telecaster. You know what I mean? Or if they, you know, if it's a 
whatever it's like a big band session I'll take an uh, arch top acoustic and maybe a more modern jazz guitar like a mm. 175 or something um, so yeah, yeah you just ask that's really the trick. so many times though people say one thing and they want something totally different yes there's a few it, things which I will, I'll always make sure that I've got a single coil guitar of some, some sort uh, and a humbucker guitar of some sort so that's your basic and something with a trem so if I, yeah. if I take my I've got a uh, you know a, a, a 60s strap um, uh, which is it sounds great and uh, I'll, I'll take my um, Les Paul and maybe a 335 and that's that's probably mo- there's Most a good chance to, yeah. if you can't cover it with that yes yeah, there's a good chance you, you've got everything sorted there you know uh, and, and if people are really into guitars and they're very specific about what guitar you want to bring they're going to tell you they're going to tell you yeah anyway. <laughs> and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be on the tube and things like that anyway. Oh you? no 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 I mean, no no! no. Uh, unless unless your stuck gear's already there, then you it's know. Easy, yeah. yeah, then it's easy. Yeah, but um, yeah, I'm just, that's that's the best thing to do. Is just ask what they want. And do you, you know. get sessions? Um, do people send stuff fast to you now? And do that kind of stuff? You do, do that, yeah. Sorry, say again. Do what? people send files and you do the? Session oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah yeah yeah. I mean, it's uh, I'd say it's maybe sort of ten or fifteen percent of my work is that. Really? Yeah. Oh wow! Because mine's the other way around. Oh, is it? It used is that to be right? all going to studios, and now it's largely people sending files and right, which I much preferred going into the studio. Oh god, yeah. I mean, I, so I, I, much more. Yeah, me too. Well, you see people as well, uh, and and you're uh, in a proper room. You're in a proper room, uh, and also I think the thing is with internet sessions is that they can they they can take forever. What what hmm. might, could be solved in a conversation of ten seconds? You know, someone's like, "Oh, can we have it a bit more like this?" or da whatever. If they're in a different country or whatever, by the time they've you've uploaded the file, they've downloaded it, imported it into their track, uh, and then made a judgment on what they like, and then sent you an email or whatever, or Skype yeah, you or whatever. I mean, it takes forever. So uh, yeah, the yeah. honest truth is, I actually turn turn a lot of it down. You know, um, good position to be in. That's <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, because uh, it's not. A lot, it can end up being not economically viable. Because it, they'll say, oh, how much for a, a 30 second jingle? And you think, oh, 30 second jingle, it's not going to take very long, and you'll quote them a price. And then you're back and forwards all day. And before mm. you know it, you're earning less than you would do, you know, asking me if they want fries with that. Yeah, <laughs> you know exactly. what I mean? So it's not worth it a lot of the time. So if somebody's, the, basically, the two criteria, that, well, the criteria that I have for saying yes to an internet session is if somebody's incredibly specific and they send like a written out PDF of exactly what they want, then that's fine. Or if somebody's the other extreme when they say just do your thing, then that's fine as well. Yeah. If they're muddling around in the middle and they don't really know what they want and you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, nah. You know, because it could potentially, I could be there all day. Mm. You know, and I've actually, the only time I've ever, uh, yeah, I remember it was a few years ago when I first started doing internet sessions. And they were a bit of an unknown thing, you know, not everyone was doing, it was all quite new. And, I was working for this lady and she, she she was doing a documentary on something and it was sort of semi she described it as rock when she didn't want rock at all. I can't remember what it was, mm-hmm. something completely different. And in the end I said, you know what? With all due respect, just keep what I've given you. There's no charge, but I'm not doing this. And it's the only time I've ever done that because it just went on for days, you know, and I'd given it well, it was just completely ridiculous. So I'm a bit more strict about what I do in that mm-hmm. regard now, you know. And the and the studio I remember seeing um the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra recorded uh, the Hobbit sessions. Oh, and right. I've done a heap of stuff with it with that orchestra, and I went and saw them and said, "If you need a guitar player, <laughs> you guys know me, right?" Yeah, and right. It ended up you did it, you did the session because <laughs> they did it here. Oh, and it actually made a lot of oh, yeah, sense yeah, yeah, because yeah. they um, obviously being the other side of the world and the other time. I remember so that they yeah. could record that stuff during the day, and they said, "Well, they can do the rhythm section or guitar or whatever yeah. you were doing here." While everybody in New Zealand was sleeping, and that kept a twenty-four hour clock. Is that what is that what happened? Because mm. I I remember we recorded that in Abbey Road. I remember doing. I certainly remember one of the sessions. I can't remember how many did. It was the Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies. I think they called it or something mm. like that. And uh, it was me, uh, another guitar player called John Paracelli, who's a local guy, who's yeah, a that. fabulous studio player, um, and very nice man. And we recorded that in Abbey Road One, which is the big posh studio where they, you know, they do all the symphony orchestras and things, the film orchestras. They have somebody on the line from LA. I can't remember, who was the composer? Was it Howard, Howard Shaw? Shaw? It yeah. was Howard Shaw, yeah. Uh, so Howard was on from LA or New York um, and they had a other 
members of the creative team in New Zealand at the same time. Mm. So, and, and we were all talking to each other, which is, mm. that's crazy. <laughs> you know that's what I mean? And it's and in real that, time. Oh, yeah. it was unbelievable. The technology is, uh, there's a name for it, I can't remember what it is. Um, it was incredible. Mm. Yeah, really incredible. You know? And you've got them all in your headphones. I've got people talking to me from like 19 different continents. You know? uh, yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool. Yeah. Sorry, I nicked your gig. <laughs> uh, oh man, I'm sorry, not glad sorry. You're working. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, that te- technology, while it's helped a lot of things, has kind of ruined a lot of things in music too, hasn't it? Yeah. It's kind of income being. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's interesting. Like, do, do you have, you've got albums of your own out? I think haven't you? you've done one. Or yeah, two, I, I did. I wouldn't recommend anyone buy it. Oh, <laughs> to come, be on, honest. come on, come on. Sure that, that's great. Uh, what you mean? You, you haven't heard it? I haven't. <laughs> I, I um, no, no, to be honest, that that side of my playing is more. Uh, I look at it like a hobby. To be honest, it, it keeps my playing. Uh, I, it makes me. You know, if I've got a gig in a bar or something, it, I have to practice for it, and I have to relearn my own tunes and get a bit of jazz together, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I actually look at that side of it. I mean, it does, it's really useful because it makes you practice and it makes you think about music in a different way. But um, I do think of it as more more of a hobby than anything else, you know. Mm. So, you know, I, I don't think of myself in any way as like a solo artist, you know. Interesting, isn't solo, it? Yeah, I'm kind of like that as well. My, yeah. my albums are passion projects and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Know. I think it's important to do though. Absolutely. You know, because if you're just in the studio playing jingles or whatever all day, you'll, you'll go mad. That's not not really music. That's just a, you know, like a factory. Yeah, you know. it, can, it can be, can it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that three, three, you mentioned about the 335 earlier, mm. so I'll jump My baby. that. My yeah. baby. Um, it's a 60, which, do you know? Uh, it's a 67. 67. Do you want me to get it? I can get it. Can yeah, sure, it. Yeah. While well, we're nerding out on guitar stuff, I might as well. Yeah, I'll go and get it. So, yeah, so my, my two main guitars are oddly from the same year, which is 1967. This is um, 335. Uh, it's got, it's, I, was quite, I lucked out with this one because a lot of the late 60s ones can have really um, thin necks, and especially at the nut, they're really thin, but this one's quite chunky for a late 60s. Mm. So it's more like a 64, right. but it's half the price. Um, it was half the price. I don't know how much they are now. Because that's um, one of the big things that, that I've always found with the 60s is that thin nuts. Yeah, 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 yeah. This one doesn't have that for some reason. I guess they were all made. <laughs> Dogs turned up again. <laughs> I guess they were. Um, I guess they were all handmade. All the, all the necks are different. Every every 60s one that I've played is. <laughs> um, take it. Don't mind me. Don't mind me. It's fine. Um, but yeah, so it's quite it's quite chunky, which which I quite like. So it is more. I played a 64, and it was really similar to this. Mm. Um, uh, and these are obviously they're the patent sticker pickups as opposed to the PAF pickups but they are to all intents and purposes as far as I know they're the same thing um, screws falling off um, but they just you know they, they don't command the same price so yeah that's a great guitar and awesome the, yeah that was uh, the one you had at the, uh, the Woodman the other day yeah I just you, you, I, I, I take this on every session this is the only this is the only common thing for every session for me is I always take this because I, I always end up using it because it just sounds so great actually this is a replacement this used to have a trapeze ah uh, yeah um, as they did that year but I was such a big Larry Carlton fan that I wanted to you know um, have the stop tail piece and this is actually made by a company called Callahan or Callahan yep, which I I, yeah I, they're pretty well known and they make great quality stuff, and I'm really pleased that I did that, you know. Um, so awesome. yeah, this is brilliant, great guitar. Um, the other one, which is from the same year, is this, the Telecaster, um, uh, which is a refinished. Um, so because it's a, it's a nice, the road, it'll make the, it'll make it, oh yeah, yeah, it was accessible. Are just... Oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, oh, what did I pay for this? Maybe six, Six thousand. Oh, I can't remember exactly what I paid, but that's enough. I don't want to pay that's any more. That's enough. a lot of money, you know. I don't want to pay any more than that. And but if you get a um, one which is all original, it's there. You know, it's several thousand more probably. I don't know exactly how much more, but it's and it sounded great to me. And I tried it up against an all original um, with a. I think it had a maple neck. Maybe it's a couple of years earlier. Which so it's a bit more classic twangy telly sound. But I just preferred this. Just was warmer, you know. Um, so yeah, those are the two main, the two nice. main ones, I guess. And if you can't get it done with these and a strap, 
Yeah, exactly. What do you, yeah, what do you, you need to? <laughs> do the some guitars. Practice. The guitars aren't the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's got no more excuses. It's amazing though. There's some people out there who've got crazy money who, who, who buy all kinds of gear. And yeah. And can't play. Oh God! Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I've, um, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. So <laughs> I won't say what I was going to say. Bit, though, bit yeah. kids and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know, I know a couple of people like that. Um, actually, I have a relative of mine. Actually, he's not a bad player. He's a relative by marriage who owns uh, a '59 Les Paul, a real '59 Les Paul, uh, and also a real '57 Gold Top, which is one of the nicest guitars I've ever played in my life. Mm. Um, and he's got, uh, well, he's got dumbbells and all sorts of. Wow, you know, he was never a professional, um, but he had the money and the thing. Yeah, the money, yeah, yeah, yeah and good for him. Yeah, you know, he, he does gig them. That's the thing. You know, well, they do get cool. used, which mm. is you know good for him. But I don't think there's many professional musicians, unless you're a rock star. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, then like unless Keith you're Joe Bonamassa, yeah, yeah. yeah so then then you're gonna have a real fifty nine Les Paul. But I don't know anybody who does my kind of job who's gonna spend two hundred thousand pounds on a guitar. Yeah, it's just I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Because violinists do that, but. Well, yeah, but they only have one. That's right. I mean, exactly. I've got like yeah. 30 guitars. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's. Which when you add up the value of them, it's probably about <laughs> it's the same. a few million quid. Isn't it? Like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is probably about the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and yeah. you had a. The amp you had that night, I saw you too, was a. Um, what was it? A red plate. A red plate. Yeah, that, it's really interesting. Basically, it's a dumble. Mm. You know, it's, it's, that's what it's supposed to be. It looks like a dumble. I, I think it's called an overdrive, overdrive classic or something in the same font as the mm. the overdrive it special it totally looked like it was yeah. inspired by it uh, yeah so. I mean, it, it is and uh, I've played a real dumbbell and it does sound like it you know uh, it, more importantly it felt like it had that response um, uh, it sounded so, great it was killer it looked great it's a great amp yeah it's 50 mm. watts it's incredibly loud uh, yeah it's a great amp it's a great amp I don't think they're a huge company American they did me a deal thanks yeah, yeah. So they should. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and the, the guy I communicated with directly with the guy who builds them. I don't think they're a huge organisation. He was really helpful, and he made a couple of little tweaks that I wanted. You know, oh, nice. but it's it's also like with the dumble. You don't the effects loop. I think you have to have that. It's called a dumbelator. Yeah, dumbelator. Yeah. yeah, which that's a pain in the ass for me as a working musician. That's just a pain in the ass. And somebody who uses lots of different setups. You know, I guess if you're like. Robin Ford or Larry Carlton or somewhere like that where, where you basically have your one setup and that's your thing mm. that's probably a, okay and you've got Tex running around after you and I can't be doing you know I haven't got well he's big... the hot rod de villain New Zealand <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which are, and they're great amps mm. I mean uh, and that's when like, they go yeah know, well I've I've had, if you can't get the sound out oh yeah I've yeah. never had a problem with them but if you can't get a good sound out of a hot rod de villain then like the same with with guitars, mm. you know. Then then the gear is not the problem. Mm. You know, they're great amps. Yeah. And he just had a small pedal board with um, you know, the the Zen drive, and that was pretty Job much kind of his. Yeah, thing. yeah, absolutely, yeah. And he had yeah. a, a, a fifty seven Les Paul, I think it was, which were, had P nineties, and he'd swap them for humbuckers. Okay. Which is sacrilege. Some. What a, re a real fifty seven? He'd done that with, had he? Yeah. Well, he said it's the only way he was going to get that type of guitar. And yeah, yeah, to. yeah, 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 yeah. But that's cool. That I mean, man. Oh, those, I love those are some yeah. beauties. Yeah, yeah, I love them. Yeah. Have, have you ever been yeah. to Norman's Three Guitars? No, no, I haven't. I'd love to go. Oh. Yeah. I've watched a lot of the videos. Put your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Norm comes out and Harry. And he's yeah, yeah. I don't think my wife would be very happy if I <laughs> went to Norman. She doesn't know what Norman's Rare Guitars is. If she did, she would not want me to go there. Yeah. <laughs> But that yeah. place is crazy. So, is there guitar stores like that here that do like vintage Norms? guitar? Yeah, there are. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure there's anything on the scale. I mean, I've never been to Norms, but it looks enormous. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't think there's anything on the scale of that. I mean, I bought my '59 Junior from uh, New Kings Road Vintage Guitars, and they've got a bunch of nice stuff. Who, who else? There's uh, uh, yeah, a very nice guy called Ron who he works or owns. I think he's the owner. I'm not sure. Um, in they're called No Tom guitars on Denmark. Oh yes, Street. yes, they've yeah. been to Denmark Street. Yeah, yeah, and they they I've bought some stuff from them. In fact, they're Telecasters from them. Oh, all right. Because um, Denmark Street was quite different than I expected. Like, I, well, it's changed a lot over the past few years. Is it? Yeah. Um, what did you expect? Well, I was expecting vintage guitars everywhere, and it no, wasn't no, really no, that no, anymore. No, it's, it's no, it, it isn't that because they cater. That's a limited market. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and there's loads of young guys and girls who want to play like they want a shreddy sort of you know like a 
18 string Ibanez or something, mm-hmm. which goes, <laughs> you know. Like, do you ever do that kind of stuff? Have no. to play those. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yeah, because yeah, I don't even, I wouldn't even know where to start with any no. more than six strings. Yeah, no, I, I don't, no, that's just confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did, I did start learning metal when I was a kid, you know, so that's mm-hmm. sort of where I come from. But back then it was like, it wasn't, it was like a, I guess like that, uh, I mean, I was like Iron Maiden and Metallica and Megadeth and uh, mm. all those sort of bands, you know, I guess it was uh, late 80s, early 90s when I was sort of just getting into that s- stuff, you know. Um, so you must be about the same age as me then. I'm 42. Oh, I'm 40, well, coming up to 41. Ah. So, 78. The youngsters. Yeah, I know, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I um, feel old these days. Yeah, tell me about it. There's kids that do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, great, man. And, and you're teaching at Guildhall. Do you do A little any, bit. Not a lot. Is it just like a, a um, adjunct teaching type stuff, or are you on faculty? Or uh, adjunct. Adjuncts, or you're like, um, you go in and you teach your day a week, and then you leave? And oh, they come here, actually. They come to my studio out the back. Uh, really? Yeah, they do. Uh, and the wow. reason for that is is because the thing that I have to offer is recording. You know, it's sort of recording yeah. skills. So if, if I'm sitting in, in a room with somebody, it's like... They've got other guys who teach there, like Mike Outram teaches there. He's a phenomenal jazz guitar player. Was a phenomenal mm-hmm. guitar player, but he's so I can't teach to the same level that you know the, the stuff that he knows about that. And they've got the uh, uh, same people in classical mold and the same, you know they've got a bunch of great teachers who are really great one on one teachers. But so that's the thing that I'm there for is the you know say playing in a bunch of different styles and recording and you know maybe reading and all that all that kind of stuff you know. Right. Um, so they come here but I don't do much of it I, maybe one or two lessons a week that's oh right so yeah because yeah, yeah, I, I, I like I don't want to be like oh I've got to teach now I want to like if someone comes for a lesson I want to be able to give them yeah and be inspired to do it yeah yeah because yeah, yeah, it's not fair if you know if they come for a lesson they're expecting you know first of all they're paying for it and second of all you don't want to be the guy that puts someone off you know yeah. what I mean you don't want to just sit there and be all miserable so um and a lot of the time, they're, and it's especially my Guildhall students, I mean, they're all amazing. And they're incredible, you know. So I just sit there most of the time, how'd you do that? Yeah. <laughs> Show me how to do that again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, um, the, the standard of guitar players here seems pretty good from what I've seen so far. Yeah, it's scary, um, yeah. Scary. Yeah. And, and so doing those theatre shows, you, you, you dip on them more. Have you ever done uh, a season of them? or? Oh, yeah, no, I, I don't want to do depping, to be honest. I, I, the honest truth is because it's too scary. It's so terrifying. Especially I'm, as a guitar player. Oh. Because, you, you, you know, having... Well, you've got somebody else's gear. You don't get rehearsal. You don't get soundtrack. You get nothing. And, you know, like, if, if I did... The last show I did, it was the Carol King musical. I did that for... It was about two years. And it was a great band. And it's brilliant music. Is it Carol King and James Taylor and all that, all that, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, so that, that's really nice when you get to play something like that. And you don't have to be there. You know, you can do 50% of it and then you can do, go and do other gigs. Mm-hmm. And we had Neil Wilkinson on drums, who's incredible. My uh, Steve Pierce, uh, again on bass, a great horn section, uh, another great guitar player, guitar two, um, Lewis Osborne, who's a great player. Um, so we just had a, we had a really nice time, you know. Okay. That was good. But And we did get up and walk out the pit every so often. No one cared. Um, and do they pay well here for that sort of stuff? Because I, I believe like a lot of the guys here have sort of said they, they can be quite lucrative. Well, it depends on your idea of lucrative. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you added it all up with the holiday, if you did everything, and there's all the holiday pay and all that, you know... You'd be making a reasonable living. Well, it's about, I think it's maybe 75 grand a year or something like that, if you do everything, you know. So it's, yeah. certainly you can live on it, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you will go mad if you do it all, though. No one can do it all, <laughs> yeah. though, but, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's pretty decent, you know. Um, but then, then you get to, you can do whatever you want in the daytime. You can do your sessions and... Mm. Um, you know, whatever. It's it's usually the best part of a couple of hundred quid for a gig. So eight of those a week plus your yeah. holiday pay and whatever. It's yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's it's certainly. I mean, mm. you can see why people do it because the pop gigs are just that can be appallingly played. They're taking advantage of a lot of the younger players in their twenties and getting them to play in arenas for for the same kind of money, which is yeah. Oh, no, tell me about it. Yeah, really. Uh, and, and not not booking the guys who should be doing it because they can get someone else well, cheap. That was going to do on. They're going to play in Wembley Arena for two hundred quid. That's not going to yeah, happen, exactly. is it? You know, that, that, 
Um, but the, the problem is there are there are people who will do it, you know, or you know, even you know, even a little bit more than that. It's still not enough for those kind of the economics which which are you it's know the scale in, of it. That's right. The, exactly. It. Yeah. It's just uh, they're taking the piss, really. You know. But that's another subject. Yeah, I think that's part of the, one of the issues I have with the music industry. Now, yeah, I'm sure you probably feel the same. Is that I think musicians make it bad for themselves. Well, because we know? love it, don't we? Yeah, exactly. So someone says, someone, do you want to do this gig?" And you go, "Oh yeah, yeah, I really want to do that. It sounds amazing." And they go, "This is the money." And you go, "Oh, I still really want to do it." Okay. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, so yeah, because it's, it's something you're passionate about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. It's because you love it, mm. don't you? And you go, and, and you've bought this guitar, and I'm going, to, I'm going to bring this guitar, and I can get this pedal. That'd be perfect for this gig. And you get into it, don't you? You know, because we love it. And and people who are you know in accounts department know that you know mm. or whatever management people you know they know it so they they'll take advantage of it mm. you know? not all of them I'm not saying everyone in those jobs are bad sorry accountants um, <laughs> well you, I mean their job is to save money isn't their it jobs to save money so they're <laughs> so, coming up against uh, it's an easy goal isn't it it's like mm. it's like uh, you know it's like selling guitars to us isn't it being a guitar salesman that's mm. the easiest job in the world isn't it exactly. so look at this look at this do you want to buy it yes of course you want to buy it. You know? <laughs> Yeah, you already wanted to buy it before you went in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's I've seen huge changes with it with that with Spotify and things. And yeah, had that discussion with someone the other day, and they said, "Well, should I put my music on Spotify?" And I was like, "Well, it's a, you depends what you whinge, want. You can't whinge and moan about it if you're yeah. going to give them your product. Yeah. That's basically what it is. Yeah, yeah. And imagine if all musicians decided, no, you can't have our product." That business model for Spotify would change real, really quick. Yeah, yeah. But it there's no, to. you know, I mean, yeah, that's the, well, you could call it a union, yeah. <laughs> couldn't you? You know, um, but that's not going to happen. But there is a union here, though, for musicians. There it? is, yeah. And actually, I tell you where they work really well is in the West End, you know, in, in mm-hmm. West End shows. They're very, they're great there, you know, there's rules, you know. I mean, I don't, I don't do so much of that anymore, to be honest. I used to do a lot, especially, in, you know, in my 20s. I, I think I did about 10 years straight, you know. Um, I'm not really doing any any anymore, um, but I was very grateful to have it. Mm-hmm. You know, it enables you to buy a house or whatever. Um, when the union were, were great for that that sort of stuff, you know. Where well, the union's healthy here? Yeah, it is for TV. I mean, I've done I, I, my first TV show was Pop Idol in about the first series I did. I'd done a couple of shows before that, but that was about twenty years ago. It was about 2000, 1999, 2000 when I did the first two series of that. And then a bit of stars in their eyes, and then I mean I've done loads of TV over the years, and mm. they're pretty like, three years on the Voice, you know, in the mm. house band for that, and then just loads of TV, some depths for John on Strictly, Come Dancing, and like, just like, loads of that kind of stuff over the years. And Strictly and that's, Come Dancing is Dancing with the Stars, and yeah, that's the same thing, the same isn't it? Show. Right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, it's not my gig as John and Paul Dunn, who are both great, but I've done it quite a few times for them, and uh, yeah, that's all quite heavily regulated as well, you know. Um, uh, but it's really good fun as well because a lot of the a lot of the bands are fantastic. I mean, most of them are, you know. Yeah, yeah. And is the session scene part of the union, or is it just everybody? Does well, it's usually a govern. I mean, rhythm section players, we have, you know, a, a tendency to sort of be a bit. You know, the string sections are very, a bit more sort of unionized. We sort of go in and go out on our own agreements a lot of the time. If somebody wants. Uh, like uh, I don't know, a couple of cellos and a couple of violins. They might have people that they want to work with, but a lot of the time they'll they'll just want a couple of good quality cellos and violins or whatever the lineup is. Mm. You know, if they want a guitar player or a drummer, a lot of the time people have specific ideas about who they want. You know, because so because the stylistic variations are such that you know, you know, you might have somebody's really good at big band music or some a drummer is really good at big band music or really good at drum and bass or whatever the style is. You know, so they're a bit more picky about who they want. So. Mm. We tend to sort of chart our own path a little bit more. I saw, an, uh, it's funny too, I, I first heard of you, I don't know if I ever told you this, but when I first heard of you, there was this guitar magazine, and I think it was a guitarist or guitar player or one of those um, British magazines, and they were they were talking about careers in music. Oh, <laughs> that was the, the first series of The Voice, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, one of yeah. the careers was session musician, and that was, there, there was <laughs> Neil... Um, Neil Taylor. Neil Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was in there as He's well. He's great. And that was the first time I'd heard of you, and they did, they did a big kind of expose on what you're up to and your yeah. music and things. So yeah, that was a few years ago now, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. <laughs> but um, seven or eight years ago, I guess. Mm. Yeah. We had so much fun on that. The first series of that. That was just before I had I had kids. So, uh, 
I didn't have to go home. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Much, you yeah know, woken up at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We had the best time, you know, because they, they said to us, um, they, they said, right, it was me, Ian Thomas on drums, who's he's Mark Knopfler's drummer, he's been Clapton's drummer, um, he's done everything, he's a complete genius of the drums, and also incredibly nice bloke, really down to earth. My friend Jerry Meehan on bass, who's he's Robbie Williams' bass player, um, a guy called Steve Sidwell was the MD who I've been working for for years, who I was just brilliant he's been amazing with me over the years um pete murray on keys um and that was the core of the rhythm section and it was run by a guy called paul spong who is a great trumpet player he sort of ran the ran the band kind of the fixer basically um uh, and they said they said it was a bit of a mistake looking back they said right we want we don't want you to be like a tv band we want you to act like a like a rock band (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and we were like like all these BBC Trump. people with clipboards and stuff and we were like you do, are you, are you sure it's, you mean that yeah, yeah. And, and so we did <laughs> and we all got fired no we didn't oh really <laughs> no <laughs> um, oh man that's, that's, a, that's a dangerous it was just like, it was like we all looked at each other we were like hey, do, do you, you really do you really know what you're saying there? I'm not sure you do yeah. Yeah. oh fantastic Thanks, oh, dude. I really appreciate it. And, oh, um, my pleasure. My it's been pleasure. great to hang and talk guitars and all that My pleasure. Stuff. You're welcome. Yeah. Mm. Cheers. And uh, if people want to hear more of you, where can they do so? You can't. Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I do, well, I just, That's I, how I'm going to edit there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will, actually. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. I mean, no, they can't, really.